Let's start with a, a prayer. For Father in, in heaven, we thank you for this morning and we pray that you'll be with us as we make a joyful noise unto you. And please lead me as, as I lead out in, in the message this morning and pray that um, the things that I've gone over will be fresh in my mind, that your spirit will reveal them to me, Father. And I thank you and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And more, one, uh, good morning once again. And it's good to see uh, many of you here. I came here early and I didn't know if I was going to just be talking to a camera. <laughs> of course, I'm sure there are people behind it, but uh, it's nice to have some people here. And uh, our talk this morning is Gods of the Imagination. And it goes well with our message last night that uh, Brother Barlow uh, brought to us. It deals with an aspect of what Babylon is. It deals with the gods of the imagination, hopefully not our imagination. We want the true God in our imagination. It says in Matthew 24, 37, 38, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And you not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They were interested in, in self-fulfillment, doing what they wanted to do, and they were not obeying the will of God. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No good thoughts there. And as I pondered uh, this, I thought about something that Sister White had said, and I don't have the quote here, but she said that if they had been keeping the Sabbath, this would not have happened. They would not have gone after false gods because there would have been that sacred time. And that's important for us because remember that these things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth are come. In Genesis 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And of course we know that Cain was rejected because he did not obey God's will. Sister White says, The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from his pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angels. At the, at the cherubim-guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. And so this is where they came, and it was where they offered sacrifice. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law, the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the earth, the wickedness of men determined their destruction by the flood of waters. The hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. So God took Eden away. But here we see this vow to God's law, its obedience to God's will and to what he had ordained. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven, new earth, it is to be restored, more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. This is from Adventist Home, page 539, paragraph 1. What a picture here of the sinner's state. Although surrounded with the blessings of his love, there is nothing that the sinner, bent on self-indulgence and sinful pleasure, desires 
much as separation from God, so much as separation from God. Like the ungrateful son, he claims the good things of God as his by right. And so, remember Cain, he went out from the presence of God and dwelt in the land of Nod. So, at that point, when he had murdered his brother and, and left, he no longer came to the gate with others and worshipped. And that's a striking image, I think, of of the, God's true church. There are people who go out from God's presence and they worship with others like them and they worship in a way that God has not ordained or they worship a God that is not the God of the Bible. He makes them as a matter of course and makes no return of gratitude, renders no service of love as Cain went out from the presence of the Lord to seek his home, as the prodigal son wandered into the far country, so do sinners seek happiness in forgetfulness of God. And that's something that's really important because what people will do is they will invent their own gods. They'll project even themselves into a being that doesn't exist. That's from Christ's Object Lessons. Page 200, paragraph 2. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Romans 1, 28. So here we see it repeated again. They didn't want to hold on to God in their minds because it was a rebuke. It reminded them of what they were trying to do was wrong. In Romans 1 verses 21 and 22 it says, because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise they became fools. And so they didn't respect God, they didn't hold him up to be who he was. They cast him down to their level and they made him like themselves. It says in 23 and 24, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible, uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So they lived that lie and served the ordinances that they created that their gods of their imagination produced. And of course, Satan was there whispering in their ear, as it were, to, to invent these new things also. It wasn't, I'm sure, all purely their invention. Inspiration comes from one of two sources. As concerning, therefore, and this is 1 Corinthians 8.4, it says, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. It's nothing. It's something they produced from their imagination. In 1 Corinthians 10, 19, 20, it says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Once again, no. But he continues, but I say that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye have fellowship with devils. And so you can see Satan is ready to come in. When there's something there that misrepresents God, he will affirm it and make it seem as though it's the truth. And certainly uh, back, well, it's been more than 10 years ago, uh, we were doing studies on false alternative healing and this is a principle there where people would, would practice 
certain techniques that, that were not uh, biblical, not ordained, but sometimes things would happen. And, and Sister White talks about those things. The Bible gives us um, a, these principles of healing, but Satan will step in and work if we let him because Satan is a liar and he seeks to move in when there is a lie. In uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page, uh, page 266, paragraph 4, and this is just the first half of the paragraph, it says, The Lord first established the system of sacrificial offerings with Adam after his fall, which he taught to his des descendants. This system was corrupted before the flood, and by those who separated themselves from the faithful followers of God and engaged in the building of the Tower of Babel. So it happened before and after the flood. They sacrificed the gods of their own making instead of the God of heaven. They did not offer sacrifices because they had faith in the Redeemer to come, but because they thought they should pe uh, please their gods by offering a great many beasts upon polluted idol altars. And, you know, it's sad that a lot of modern Christianity think the same thing about the Jews in the Old Testament when they, um, ancient Israel, when they offered sacrifices. They think it was just an appeasement system. It was, they make it something that was not. And that's sad. Their, their understanding is darkened. But praise God, he can lead us to where we can learn these things. The men of that generation were not all in the fullest exception of the term idolaters. Many professed to be worshipers of God. They claimed that their idols were representations of the deity and that through them the people could obtain a clear conception of the divine being. This class were foremost in rejecting the preaching of Noah. And you would think that because they were closer in belief that they might accept it more. But there's a reason why this happened. Says, As they endeavored to represent God by, by material objects, their minds were blinded to his majesty and power. They ceased to realize the holiness of his character or the sacred, unchanging nature of his requirements. As sin became general, it appeared less and less sinful, and they finally declared that the divine law was no longer in force, that it was contrary to the character of God to punish transgression, and they denied that his judgments were to be visited upon the earth. So what they did was they changed God's character they substituted him for something else, even though they claimed it was just a representation. They placed something else in, in place of God. And it could be, you know, they, sometimes when you reach out to minister to people, they already have some answers, and they can be sometimes the most stubborn. Um, they may not even want to listen to you. It's maybe people who, who don't have an answer who will listen because they want to learn something that they didn't know. Had the men of that generation obeyed the divine law, they would have recognized the voice of God in the warning of his servant. But their minds had become so blinded by the rejection of light that they really believed Noah's message to be a delusion. This man is a fanatic. And that's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95, paragraph 3. They're so close, and yet so far. And that's so sad. In 1 John 5, 20 and 21, it says, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen.
you know, and a lot of times we read these verses, and I know I've looked at, at this verse, and, and I, I know we've all probably at one time or another done it. And says, well, how, how interesting. John finishes up here, um, it says in this chapter, this, um, this about, I, yeah, in the book, like, or well, it's uh, his uh, epistle, his letter. You know, he, he's saying, stay away from idols. Like, why does he finish with that? But it goes immediately with the context of verse 20 there. This is that we may know him that is true. Because if we have an idol, we're not going to know the God of the Bible as he reveals himself. We're going to put something in our imagination that isn't real. Christ gave his life that all who would might be freed from sin and reinstated in the favor of the Creator. It was the antici anticipation of the redeemed holy universe that prompted Christ to make this great sacrifice. Are we followers of God as dear children, or are we servants of the Prince of Darkness? You know, and, and when he says in that verse before, um, little children, you think he's just talking to children? And he's talking to his brethren and sisters. You know, we are to be as little children obedient to God. It's, it's when we don't trust God that we start looking for other solutions. Are we worshipers of Jehovah or of Baal? And see, I thought, or of the living God, or of idols. And, and pay attention to that. I probably should have highlighted that. Of the living God. It says, no outward shrines may be visible, but there, uh, there may be no image for the eye to rest upon. Yet we may be practicing idolatry. It is as easy to make an idol of cherished ideas or objects as to fashion gods of wood or stone. And that might be what's supplanted in our minds. And it will hinder us in our learning and our worship. Thousands have a false conception of God and his attributes. There is verily serving a false God as were the servants of Baal. God is a God of truth and doesn't stop there. Justice and mercy are the attributes of his throne. He is a God of love, of pity, and tender compassion. These are attributes. Thus he is represented in his Son, our Savior. He is a God of patience and long-suffering. If such is the being whom we adore and whose character we are seeking to imitate, we are worshiping the true God. So it's not simply about the name, but remember a name um, refers to character or characteristic or attribute. So we can't just give God any name, but certainly the attributes are just as important, if not more so. In Psalms 86, verse 15, it says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. And so these are attributes. David understood who he worshipped. In Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6, it says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, speaking of Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children upon the third and to the fourth generation. And that's Exodus 3, 4, 7. If you look at some of these false deities that people have worshipped, 
some of these characteristics are very distinctly missing. You have to constantly appease them. Otherwise, their wrath will come full force. And it says in verse 8, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. This is a God worthy of worship. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go up, excuse me, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stick-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine, thine inheritance. And that's the problem. There's stubbornness. God had to be patient with them. And he has to be patient with us. Sometimes we just don't get it. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, it says, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when he, they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And so the people, they, they did not want to follow um, God like they had. They wanted a king to be like the other nations. So they were seeking after something else other than God. And it says, um, and uh, the, uh, the, some of these quotes are from the book um, Eternity Past, which is a, a rewording of... Um, Sister White's uh, book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and I think part of Prophets and Kings. So um, I, I wanted to um, let you know. So the wording might be a little bit different if you uh, look it up. But it was, it was very much um, highlighted in my notes, so I, I wasn't paying attention to that. But it says pretty much what it, uh, I want to, uh, I compared them. So it says, in Saul, God had given to Israel a king after their own heart. As Samuel said, Behold the king whom you have chosen, whom you have desired. His appearance accorded with their conceptions of royal dignity. His personal valor and ability in the conduct of armies were qualities they regard as best calculated to secure respect from other nations. So it's, that's all that they wanted were these these aspects that dealt with respect and with that came this visual display isn't that isn't that kind of when we look at um, false religions I mean um, the churches that that go off in apostasy you know when it's, uh, we look at some of these religions where they have grand palaces and um, they have statues and they have gold and all sorts of precious things. They have paintings everywhere. But what is that a sign of? That they're lacking spiritual substance. And that's what's happening here. They did not ask for one who had true nobility of character, who possessed the love and fear of God. They were not seeking God's way, but their own. Therefore, God gave them such a king as they desired, one whose character was a reflection of their own. And so when you look at King Saul, that's what you saw, was what the people were, what their character was, was, was being portrayed to their king. That's Eternity Past, page 461, paragraph 3. Had Saul relied upon God, God would have been with him. But when Saul chose to act independently of God, the Lord was forced to set him aside. Then he called to the throne a man after his own heart, one who would not, excuse me, one who would rely upon God and be guided by his spirit, who, when he sinned, would submit to reproof and correction. This is 
what the Bible means, you know, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, a man after God's own heart. David was correctable, he was teachable. Saul was not. When called to the throne, Saul was deficient in knowledge and had serious defects of character. But the Lord granted him the Holy Spirit and placed him where he could develop qualities uh, requisite for a ruler of Israel. Had he remained humble, every good quality would have been, would have, yes, sorry, every good quality would have been gained, gaining strength, while evil tendencies would have lost their power. This is the work which the Lord proposes to do for all who, excuse me, for all who consecrate themselves to him. And this is our hope. If we have defects in character, God can remove them. But we have to work with God and we have to humble ourselves and be teachable. He will reveal to them their defects of character and will give them strength to correct their errors. That's also from Eternity Past, page 459, paragraph 3. In 1 Samuel 16, 14 and 15, it says, But the evil, excuse me, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion originated with Satan, and all rebellion against God is directly due to satanic influence. Those who set themselves against the government of God have entered into an alliance with the arch apostate. This is what Saul was doing. He was rebelling against God. He had a spirit of self-justification, and he was also angry with God, so that they'll be in, so Saul was in league with the arch apostate, and it says, and he will exercise his power and cunning to captivate the senses and mislead the understanding. He will cause everything to appear in a false light, and that's what exactly was happening to Saul. Instead of accepting things as they were, he painted a picture in his mind. And we see that commonly uh, with a lot of people will wonder, well, why does this person think this about so-and-so or about this church? And it's because they're being influenced by the deceiver. Like our first parents, those who are under his bewitching spell see only the great benefits to be received by transgression. And Adam uh, could couldn't see anything without Eve. He, he, he didn't think that God would do something in the situation. He, he decided to take whatever fate she had. Eve wanted knowledge and, and to gain things that she hadn't had before. But they were in opposition to, to God. No stronger evidence can be given of Satan's delusive power than that many who are thus led by him, deceive themselves with the belief that they are in service of God. When Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebelled against the authority of Moses, they thought they were opposing only a human leader, a man like themselves. They projected themselves onto that man. They claimed, uh, for instance, that the congregation was pure, that there was no sin among them. Moses was a, a reprover, and he was not going to let things stand as they often did among the people. And Korah thought he could do a better job than Moses, but Moses was what? The meekest man in the world. Biblically, being meek means to be submissive to God. So how, how could Korah do a better job than the one who is just obeying God? Obviously he had something else 
that he wanted to do, some other way of thinking. He had something in his mind that wasn't real. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for therein thou judgest another, thou con condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. So you might see someone else doing something. But oftentimes, it's experience in that thing that allows you to see it. And you, you can be blinded to your own. The first thing you should do when you see a sin in someone else is ask, is that in me? It says, and they came to believe that they were verily doing God's service. But in rejecting God's chosen instrument, they rejected Christ. So when they rejected Moses, they rejected their Savior. Because that was what was ordained. Remember that we're told that there are those who are, are, who are called, those who are chosen, those who are faithful. And there are people, when, when you, and I, I, I urge you to read that uh, story in Patriarchs and Prophets about the rebellion of Cordathan and Abiram because it, it shows what goes on in the churches today. That there are people who want those positions for themselves. And a lot of times that ambition, and we learned about the demon of ambition yesterday, remember? That ambition clouds their minds. That ambition is something for something they weren't necessarily meant to have. And that's where a lot of false doctrines come from because in order to gain that leading, to gain that position, they create something new and fanciful that people want to hear. They create doctrines of the imagination, things that are put together that they came up with, certainly God didn't come up with. It says that the same spirit still exists in the hearts of those who set themselves to follow their own will in opposition to the will of God. In John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended, that shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. They place an idol in their minds, and then they seek your life. They worship another God. John 15, verses 18 and 19 now. It says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Because they have their own practices, their own, their own traditions, their own gods. How sad. When you think about the leaders of Israel, they were not worshiping God as he pre presented himself. And certainly when they were convicted that, that Jesus was the Messiah, they rejected that. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not our will, not my will, but thy will. That is what we should be striving for. For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. This is Second Corinthians 10. Um, three through five. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. So God can work with us and remove these things from our minds. 
Um, I know when I was younger, I myself had a, a very uh, corrupted view of God. I was watching some of these uh, documentaries about uh, sort of New Age healing. It wasn't. It was more linked maybe with um, people that might be practitioners of martial arts and just these different things. And over time, my my view of God became skewed. It wasn't until I started studying more, and especially uh, it helped reading the Spirit of Prophecy and understanding that Satan does step in and perform these practices. And we can go off and not really realize it and, and still claim to be Christians, and yet our view, uh, we bring God down to our level and bring ourselves even up more than what we should. So we want to pull down these strongholds and cast down imaginations. We want to bring every thought that we have into captivity of Jesus. So not only dealing with false gods, but how we deal with each other, because we're supposed to love one another. And if we just attack and we don't investigate or talk with, reason with people, we're not showing that love of God. We're not revealing his character because we need to do what is right. And what is right is what God has shown us. In Matthew 16, verses 13 and 14, it says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God the living God, not some idol, not something of the imagination, purely of the imagination. We want God to be in our imagination, but we don't want to invent something that's imaginary. He says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So God revealed it through his spirit to, to Peter. And in verse 18 it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You remember in history where they took Peter and they put a church on top of him? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say that anywhere, does it? So maybe it's a metaphor. Well, what, what could that mean then? If it's a metaphor, if we were to say that, um, as it says here, upon this rock, if it's talking about Peter, if that's what he's talking about, is it talking about his person? Well, no, if it's a metaphor, it has to be something intellectual. It's based on what Peter just said. Uh, the picture here on the slide is from that place there, uh, Caesarea Philippi. And it says there that they were traveling on the coast of, and it was, it was inland, so it was the border of the, of the city. But that city was built on a rock. And this mountain here is Mount Horeb. Uh, not Horeb, I'm sorry, uh, Mount Hermon. And these entrances there were called the gates of hell. It was, they had a temple just out in front of here, uh, uh, the temple of Pan. This is a very wicked place. But as they walked by, Jesus drew a parallel. He said, he talked about building upon a foundation. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He was talking about Satan. And... Um, What's that? False religion. Yeah. Yeah, it was a false religion. So this 
they shall not prevail against you. He was drawing uh, that parallel that you have this foundation. And what is that foundation? Is it Peter? It was what Peter said that, and did Peter come up with it? It wasn't Peter. It says, it says, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The foundation of God's church is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so there exist churches that deny this. They have created a God of their imagination. They don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They even say that the church is based exclusively on Peter. But Jesus was talking about what Peter said. It really, if you think about it, doesn't make any sense to say it was literally, because it can't be literal, because he's not under the church. Yes? I thought that in Greek, when Jesus said, Thou art Peter, it was like a small rolling stone. And then when he said, The rock upon this rock, meaning yeah. himself, he will build a stone. They, they, are, they are different word, words. They're two different words. Uh, so it's obvious to, in the Greek, that Jesus was was not saying it was Peter. It was, uh, this is, I think, one of the only Greek um, Hebrewisms, I guess you could call it, but it's not. It's a spiritual concept. Yeah, it's a, sp yeah. Who Jesus is. So that uh, in those words, um, they mean different things. Uh, Peter was a ro moving, rolling stone, and uh, Jesus was talking about a foundation. Peter was predictably unpredictable. Yeah. Oh, and there are things that, that, that uh, are skipped over. Oops. That, uh, oops, sorry. There are things that are skipped over because uh, people don't like, uh, in Catholicism, they don't like that the verse where it talks about um, Jesus rebuking uh, Peter and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, are we supposed to build our church on that? This is a, a, a human that is fallible. But Jesus, the Bible says, never sinned. He says he overcame without sin. And he is our example. His victory is our victory. How could we build on anything else? And so that, that's my message to you this morning. I guess I'm 10 minutes uh, early. So uh, let's have a prayer and finish out. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for your uh, inspiration. As we are certainly without excuse when we look at all the materials that we have to study with. Um, that even our pioneers didn't have access to. We have computers and um, lots of information, but there's also a lot of false information. There are a lot of many. Uh, there are many people who have gone astray, Father, and we might still have some things that we cl we're clinging to, Father. But help us to let them go. Help us to let go of um, our wrongful traits, Father. We we all have flaws of character. We pray that we will look upon the image of your son, Jesus, Father, that there are many who look at nature as being more prominent than it should be because we are a part of nature and we are corrupt. But you have given us a, a pure example in your word, and that is Jesus. And that should come first from nature. We, we know we can learn many things from your creation. But truly, we should look at he who is the express image of yourself. Help us and be with us throughout the rest of this camp meeting, I pray. Be with those online, those who are traveling, Father. If there's people still trying to come, pray that they will be able to come, that you will clear the way for them. Forgive us our sins, Father, and forgive us of our iniquity. And um, help us to love one another 
as you have loved us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.